Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Something special is happening. You are invited to join us on Saturday, July 13th for a live podcast recording, Jung's American Muse, Christiana Morgan's Visions and Art. Our guest will be Christiana Morgan's granddaughter, the filmmaker Hilary Morgan. Hilary will share intimate memories of her grandmother, who, as a gifted and beautiful young artist, was one of the most important women to shape Jung's ideas of the feminine principle in psychology. Her visions and art illuminated the unconscious in ways he had never imagined. Together, we'll watch Hillary's extraordinary documentary, Tower of Dreams, and after our discussion, the audience can ask questions. Click the link below to purchase your ticket at the small cost of $5. We hope to see every one of you there. One of our most popular episodes to date is an episode we did a couple of years ago on working with and integrating the personal shadow. And of course, shadow work is really up in the collective. Uh, It's something that you kind of can't escape if you go on social media. Everyone is talking about it. And of course, it's a Jungian idea. Jung came up with this idea that we have these forbidden parts of ourselves that are called the shadow and that confronting and integrating these parts are uh, really important for psychological growth. Um, But the question is, how do you know what your shadow is? Mm -hmm. We, that is a, that's quite a task even to begin to know what your shadow is. And I think that, you know, in the collective right now, the discourse on TikTok and other social media platforms makes it seem like it's a very easy thing yeah. to figure out what your shadow is and and do the shadow work. Uh, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about that because we would like to posit that it might be a bit more complex than that. And here's Young. He says, to be fully aware of the shadow would be an almost superhuman task. So uh, acknowledging that it's not something that uh, can be easily done And that uh, coming to terms with the shadow and even identifying it is really complex. So with that, stay tuned for more fun. (laughs) I think we ought to uh, take a step back uh, and just uh, at least kind of review very briefly, you know, what is it that we, that we mean by shadow? And, uh, I think there are three main kinds of aspects to it. Um, You know, one aspect is something that we just never, we just never knew. It's shadow is whatever is in the unconscious in its broadest uh, way of being understood. So it might just be something we never knew we never came across. It might be something that we've forgotten, but more typically it's what we have repressed, rejected, denied, because it's associated with feelings that are so uncomfortable. Uh, the feelings that just make us squirm of, of fear and disgust, uh, uh, anger, uh, a sense of deep moral transgression. Uh, so for those reasons, because they are anathema, to us, very much dependent upon the families we grew up in and the cultural context and the religious tradition we grew up in. Uh, these are things that are, you know, unbearable. And so we push them under, push them aside, uh, and try to keep them relegated to the unconscious so they won't bother us. 
but uh, everything in the unconscious has energy and can slip out and jump out and tackle us unawares. Uh, and at the very least, shadow takes energy uh, to keep it locked up, shoved down, set aside. And of course, at the worst, what we cannot acknowledge consciously is going to come up to bite us in the you-know-where when we're least expecting it. So you guys may be able to add to that. Well, I think that, um, Deb, you beautifully described the way the shadow system is maintenanced. Mm -hmm. That once there is the land over there, where (laughs) all the degenerate parts of ourselves abide, and then there's the moat in between it, and then there's the good good side of me over here that's bright and shiny and that it feels very distressing you know when any of the degenerates are waving at me or 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 starting an insurrection internally but shadow is not created by the ego that's something i wanted to to help people understand is that shadow creation is an unconscious process and it comes from the enormous powerful instinct to be part of the group, to be cared for, to to mirror and belong. And that's communicated to us in thousands and thousands of ways, even from infancy. So one of the things that's been discovered in early infant studies and affect studies is that shame is thought to be one of the primal emotions that babies are born with, Hmm. along with things like anger and fear and joy. And one theory is that the baby is tremendously attuned to any expression of disgust that the parent seems to generate Hmm. while they are interacting with the baby, and the baby experiences it as a kind of distressing jolt, just the way we experience shame now. And so we are subtly acculturated from early infancy to be attuned to the positive responses of our caregivers, and then in increasingly more sophisticated and thoughtful ways to thoughts, words, actions, and belief systems that once again our environment approves of and we highly register things that the environment pulls back from, expresses hostility or disgust. And we are designed to push those impulses away. But we don't feel bad about them when they first come up. It feels perfectly normal to do everything that we do as babies and toddlers and as young people. It's the system that first creates the shadow, and then by the time we're well-cooked, we come out of the oven, (laughs) whatever age that is, or I'm fully baked and browned, and I pop (laughs) out of the pan, then I've got this thing I call a personality, and I'm not even aware of all of the things that the environment recoiled from. And then we go marching off to high school or college, and just as you were saying, Deb, we are on the side of keeping the retrobrate parts of ourselves far away, and we reinforce it by feeling yeah. we yeah. too. Ooh, oh, that person is terrible. That person's disgusting. I, I just can't stand thus and such. And so the shadow system, like a government, is up and running <laughs> until midlife. Oh. <laughs> So, Joseph, you're, you're identifying that it is a, the development of the shadow is, is a developmental process that goes along with uh, the development of the personality. And Jung said that, you know, just as you were saying, that, uh, you know, as we grow, we learn what things are not appropriate and those get relegated to the shadow. And Jung once said, the shadow is everything we don't want to be. And so it's there, and we're not really aware of it. You know, it's not too far away from ego consciousness, which is why it often shows up in dreams as a, as a human figure. Or when we're drunk. 
but um, <laughs> but but it it does. Jung also said that it complements the persona. So the persona is the face that we show to the world. It's the mask that we show to the world. It's kind of who we want the world to think we are. The shadow is everything that we want to make sure the world doesn't think about us. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I think about is uh, what, what kinds of things might be in the shadow. I mean, some of them are sort of, you know, fairly predictable, you know, aggression, sexuality. These are things that we might uh, be told by our parents, caregivers, culture, teachers. No, 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 you can't be that. But a lot of times there's a family culture. And in different people's family cultures, there are certain things you're not allowed to be. So it might be uh, that your family, you had to be practical. That was your family. That was the family ethos is you must be practical. And then what's likely to be in the shadow is anything that feels impractical or whimsical. Um, I know in my family of origin, there was a real value around modesty. So one thing that was really frowned on uh, was any, any time, uh, you know, that, that being, being kind of boastful or, or kind of attention seeking was like, oh, no, 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 not that, you know. So that, that really wound up being a shadow uh, uh, kind of characteristic for me to the point that, and this is the other thing about shadow is, and we'll get into this in a bit, but we project it out on other people. And then we really hate it. Joseph, you, you started to kind of go there too. We get really turned off when we see someone else living out our shadow. So I, I've always felt really irritated, especially by women who feel really comfortable kind of claiming center stage. It's like, oh, it's like nails on a chalkboard. So the, yeah, those are just some, some more uh, maybe descriptors of uh, how we can think about shadow. I want to go back to what uh, you said, Joseph, just sort of highlight it, that, uh, that it's an unconscious process. You know, so Lisa, you're aware of, you know, the family value from your family of origin about modesty. Uh, but most of the time, we're not that aware of. It takes a lot of work. Right. Uh, and and it, it's not yeah. like when I was a kid, I thought, oh, I'm not, I, my family's very modest. It, it wasn't conscious, right? This is something right. that I've become aware of. Right. But, but we might be able to ask ourselves, what was the thing I was really not allowed to be in my family of origin? What yeah. was the family value? Yeah. Right. Because when you're living it, it just seems like normal, like right. fish didn't discover water. Right. It's yeah. the brine we're pickled in. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, it's, uh, there's an automatic uh, cutoff switch, like a circuit breaker. You know, that uh, if you, you just don't even allow yourself to know uh, that you wish for this or you want that, or it, it just cuts you right off before you can even... Uh, contemplate consciously the act a sort of like gosh i was taught to be this but actually what i'd like is to be uh the lead role in uh the freshman play and i'm going to try out for it no 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 uh the circuit breaker comes right in of you know i think um i could be an alto in the chorus and i could be helpful and i'll be part of it and that's all i want and so uh, that's part of why shadow work is so hard. We, we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really hidden mm -hmm. from us and needs to be hidden because it helps us be successful in the world. People who don't have a shadow complex wind up in constant conflict with the prevailing culture, which can make it hard to thrive. Mm. Well, I think everybody has a shadow, though. That's what I mean. Yeah. Well, but I think that um, this goes to something that Jung had written about not having a persona. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That if you don't have a persona, then basically it's kind of all the things are running around. The shadow is there, that there isn't a, a bifurcation there mm -hmm. that we really need, mm -hmm. yeah, which yeah. is this kind of social lubricant yep. so that we're not constantly you know, abrading against every interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Joseph. It does help us. It is 
The development of the shadow is necessary and it's in the interest of adaptation. It's a functional complex, which is an organ in the psyche. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So how do we start to identify what our complexes are? And uh, we started to veer into this a little bit mm-hmm. ago. Uh, uh, Jim Hollis, who's written a number of books that we can heartily recommend for interested audiences on Jungian concepts, says, oh, if you want to know what your shadow is, um, just ask your best friend. Actually, um, what he says is ask your spouse. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh worse and worse. Ask. And if your spouse or a, a good friend, um, you know, comes up with something uh, that you don't like, just notice your reaction. Just, just notice, like that person said, I was uh, needy. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not. You might not say anything, but just notice what comes up inside of that instant feeling of what you touched on at the outset, Joseph, shame. Of I can't be that. I'm not that. I'm not needy, am I? And and just sit with that as as an awareness of your emotions, your feelings will tell you. Because you'll feel like you've been stung. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's the bad news. But the good news is, um, if those are things that trusted others have observed about you, how do you then take that into consideration? So I, I remember, you know, I remember being in the room when Hollis was teaching us and, and he was teaching us about the shadow and he was like, if you want to know what your shadow is, ask your spouse. And of course, everyone laughs, right? <laughs> and it is kind of a funny idea. But when, you know, it's interesting, like, what would, what would your spouse say about you? You might have some inkling or it might really surprise you. Joseph, I remember a time when we were in training and I can't remember what the I can't remember what what um, kind of what, what what brought about this discussion, but you and I were talking about something, and you sort of reflected to me like Lisa, here's how you come across, and it wasn't really how I saw myself at all, um, but you, you basically, <laughs> in so many words, you, you know, it was it. I think you were very gentle about it, but I think what you were trying to tell me was I kind of come across like. Um, uh, a little bit like a ton of bricks. <laughs> you didn't say it like that, <laughs> but but that I that I kind of come across as a little bit intimidating, maybe even. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, "That's you know, that's not that's not how I am," <laughs> you know. But it was really startling to you, you know. We were I think we, we were talking about like how, how what I might be provoking in, for example, the analysts that were training us or something. And uh, it was it was really it gave me a lot to think about. It was a big surprise. And this is also so much of what we do early in analysis that once we have a trusting relationship, that we're pointing out things that that are not conscious that are that are also causing the individual suffering. Right. And and if they did know it, then they'd have their hands on the controls a little bit. Right. And perhaps use it when it really it needs to be used but often kind of uh, you know put it in the passenger seat when it's causing problems mm. yeah that's a great point i mean one of the ways you can get to know your shadow is to really bring you know really have an analytic process cuz hopefully your therapist or your analyst will let you know now a lot of therapists find it very difficult to uh reflect uh, this kind of material to someone because it's upsetting and we, we want to be nice and we want to be supportive and we're told that we should be affirming and, and all of that. But it's not, 
it's not helpful to avoid reflecting shadow qualities to someone. I mean, uh, the psychoanalyst Karen Moroda points this out that in adult society, if you do something that routinely offends or puts off other people, they'll just stop answering your texts. They're not going to tell you. I mean, when you're kids, kids will sometimes give each other really bruising feedback, but at least it's helpful. I remember when one of my kids, you know, was pretty bossy. And uh, some, some of the other kids were kind of letting her know that. And I, and I saw, it was hard to watch, but I was like, well, that's, you know, she's having some, she's getting some feedback, you know. Uh, but we don't get feedback as adults. We just have people kind of ghost us or we don't get the job. And that can be one of the really important roles of an analyst is to say, well, you know, or, or therapist, um, I think I can see maybe how that happened. Because, you know, sometimes I experience you this way. And it's possible that other people experience you that way too. And they might find that off putting. So it's, it's hard to hear, but the reality is it's happening any way. Right. <laughs> it's, right. it's not as if you can just avoid it and, you know, that somebody's kind of rubbing your nose in it. Uh, it's acting on you. And, um, you know, to use the example you just gave us, people are constantly ghosting this person. And the person is just bewildered and hurt and insulted and angry and whoa. Let's let's just take a look at this. Something is is happening. Uh, and usually there is data, just behavioral dynamics. It's not that a therapist or, or an analyst is going to say, "Well, you know, you always just come across like." It's like last week, I remember you mentioned this, and the week before, and then you know a number of times this has come up. So to, to lift up the behavioral or outer world dynamics, and also to say, well, you know, this is welcome to the land of shadow. Right. And, and it is bruising to the ego. Uh, as it always is, we have these images of ourselves, our personas, the bright, shiny, wonderful face we want to show to the world. But not only is that not true, uh, it's not all we are. And some of those traits that are uh, not in good service to us in the waking world, if we can import them into consciousness, they can be really of service that a person whose shadow is a very needy can learn how to seek help, learn how mm -hmm. to seek support. Right. I'd like to ask for support. And who do I want to ask for support for what? Uh, somebody who is uh, ambitious. Go team. Um, how, how do you use that for your own life and your development. So it's our unconsciousness that's doing us in. Uh, not, right. not, not likely, not likely the trait itself. Well, and I just want to say that that's really well put, Deb. And I just, I want to say another word about uh, being a therapist, because I, there are a lot of therapists that listen to us. When someone's, let's say, been perpetually ghosted and maybe has gotten like this much feedback and relays that to you in session, and you can see what, like you can draw the lines and you <laughs> think you know what's going on, we feel like, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of many times that this has happened and it's like all I, my impulse is I just want to comfort the person and I just... The person maybe feels outraged and like, why does this always happen? And people are wrong and people are bad. And, you know, there's a part of me that go, wants to go, yeah, you know, it's, it, people suck that they keep doing that to you. That's not ultimately 
helpful. If you think you know what's happening, you need to, you know, you need to, 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 to st- st- stick your courage to the sticking point and say something, you know, here's what might be happening. Yeah. Cause that's, and you know, you need to do it gently like you did with me, Joseph, <laughs> but uh, you got to give some people helpful feedback. And we have to just be comfortable with the fact that there are these feelings in the room with, without rushing to comfort and gloss them right. over right. and change it to a good feeling of like, well, this is really very big. And um, there's a big feeling in the room. And we together... Uh, we we can tolerate that. We can look at it. We can be curious about it. Um, we don't have to run away from it. That's part of what the problem is, is the running away from it. Mm-hmm. So let's come back to the uh, idea of um, you know, hunting for shadow, or yep. fishing for shadow, <laughs> which is, you know, Someone's told me that we all have shadow, and now I'm going to go on the hunt and try to bag mm-hmm. me or net me a shadow. <laughs> and uh, and so there we are, you know, out in the jungle of our lives, you know, looking uh, looking for evidence of it. And one thing that we've said is, you know, we're scanning the horizon, and it's the thing that we have a very strong, often negative reaction to. Mm-hmm. Yep. So let's just choose something that is very common in the shadow forest which is dishonest. Oh, that person is such a liar. I'm so dishonest. Now, dishonest sounds pretty whitewashed. A liar, a cheat. So because we have you know, a really intense reaction, it's not just like, oh, that's not very nice. Right. But you, like your face gets red mm-hmm. when, when you're talking about it. One of the things that's difficult is that the word that our psyche uses to accuse the other is code mm. for something in the shadow that you actually language differently, mm. but it's the mm-hmm. same thing. Interesting. Say more. So one yeah. of the ways, because what well, I'll see in superficial treatments of this, oh, you accuse them of being a liar, so you must be a liar. Mm-hmm. And then people walk around saying, I don't, I'm not yep. a liar. Right. <laughs> but what it is, it's actually just the word that you're not allowed to think of yourself as a liar. So one of the things that you can do once, once you hear yourself a liar, <laughs> you know, and you're <laughs> snorting is to just look up a long list of synonyms. Hmm. So I'm not a liar, but are you ever misleading? Well, uh, are you ever evasive, dissembling, ambiguous, <laughs> economical with the truth, <laughs> misleading? Do you, do you ever blur the truth or yeah. just spin doctor a little bit of this or that? Or maybe sometimes you're just a little calculating <laughs> or have you ever just tossed around some obscure facts? Uh, have you ever tried to disguise something? Uh, so, you know, and then all of a sudden, because the, the blanket word, the hiding word, which is liar, and we lift that up and then all these little moths come out of it. <laughs> sound. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But then all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, yeah. I never thought that lying was just like me half-truthing something over here. Yep, yep. So we have to be tricky with ourselves. So you take the word that you use, you take the accusational Mm -hmm. word, Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. the way that your defense system tases the information and keeps it in the land of the bad people. Mm-hmm. And you find the synonyms, which actually creates the bridge between who you are now and that other difficult 
self-confession. Jung said that dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Dream School is our 12-month self-paced online program that teaches you how to understand these important messages from the unconscious. We break down the essential skills, teach you how to apply them, and offer opportunities for practice. You can become part of a vibrant community, join a dream group, or share your dream with other students. There are monthly live Q&As with Joseph, a chance for one-on-one time with Deb in her office hours, and monthly dream seminars with me, Lisa. Visit our website, thisjungianlife.com, to learn more or sign up. That's great, Joseph. That's just really, and there's a bunch of things that you said. First of all, I love, I love that even the term you ended with, self-confession, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but this idea, you're, you're exactly right that it's, it's never, you know, um, that, you know, when we get incensed and outraged, for example, whether it's by, you know, a friend or a colleague, a work colleague or a sibling or a politician, if we have a really kind of strong outsized reaction to something that someone did, um, even if it's, you know, genuinely horrible, if we can feel that it's just sort of, it has so much energy for us. It's like, okay, but where's that in me? But like you're saying, it's not, it, it's not going to look exactly as it looks. And, and so finding it in ourselves, it might take, I, lo- I love your idea about just going to a thesaurus and just looking, looking at the language. That's really great. So what, what we're talking about is projection. Yes, that's exactly what we've been veering into. Yeah. Do you uh, want to take it, take it away, <laughs> Deb, and talk a little bit about that? Well, I think we, first of all, here's another process that, like shadow itself, is unconscious. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just happens. Uh, in, in the blink of an eye, uh, and it bypasses consciousness, uh, you know, that that person is a liar. Oh, my God, I can't believe well, you know, we have the outrage, we have what the person did, um, we have our feelings, it's clearly out there. Uh, and then we can do the, the process that we've just articulated about you know, looking for synonyms. But if projection is also how we first encounter the world. And, and I like to think of it, here's my image for it, it's like uh, one of those big rolls of film that come in one of those great big round flat cans that's about this high, if in fact that's the way film comes anymore. I don't think it comes <laughs> like that anymore. Uh, but <laughs> Once upon a time. <laughs> but uh, while it's all rolled up and it's in the can, uh, you, you can't see the movie. It, it has to be out there so we can see it. If, if it's in here, uh, I don't have a way to observe it, to know it. You know, it's, it's sort of like asking myself, you know, uh, what is my spleen doing? It's me. So first it goes out there, and then we have to take it in, which is, you know, what you were talking about, Joseph, with uh, looking up the syn- synonyms. I see it in this person. Um, you know, that, that despicable guy from two floors below in the terrible department where they never do anything right. And, and that gives us a chance to see it and bring it back inside of where might that be in me. And your point, Lisa, is so well taken that when we're outraged, mm-hmm. When our feeling is out of proportion, uh, then we know, like, whoa, something's happening in me, which I'll loop back to what I said at the beginning, too. Just notice your feeling reactions. You have a big feeling about something, notice. And then ask yourself more about that later, you know, when the flames have died down. I mean, there's something called like emotional reasoning, right? Which is a cognitive uh, fallacy. So like that, if you feel something really, really, really strongly, it must be true. 
And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that being aware of shadow work is a time to say, well, if you feel something really, 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 really strongly, there's probably some truth in it. And you might want to wonder about what unconscious stuff is getting activated. Yep. So to kind of use myself as another example in all of this, um, you know, there was this woman who I knew at some earlier point of part of my life and she was a work colleague and she was pretty and she was like one of those women who was pretty and knew it. And she, <laughs> you know, I know, you know, and like women <laughs> like that, the way they carry themselves and the way they talk and they really like don't mind being the center of attention and everyone's paying attention to them. And and they're kind of smiling and glorying in it. And just the way she carried herself and smiled and laughed. Oh, oh, just <laughs> hated it. Um, and I, you know, and this was like, okay, so why am I having such a big reaction to this? And having shared my story <laughs> that you were not allowed to be anything but very modest in my family of origin. You know, I, you can see why that would really drive me crazy. Because she was being, um, you know, kind of a show off. And uh, so that was that was my invitation to kind of wonder, OK, what 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 in me is getting what string in me is getting plucked? And it's this. Um, this potential in me to be a show off. Hello, here I am doing a podcast <laughs> <laughs> um, that I, I, I had disowned. And, and so it, it just really bothered me when I saw this woman. We exaggerate it when we're in the accusational defense. Yeah. And we need to kind of, it's like a homeopathic remedy. We have to titrate it way down so we can put a little of it in our, under our own tongue and say, ah, yeah, 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 I'm, I am kind of like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I like that, the and accusational over time, defense, yeah. Yeah, over time, then we can, we can actually really swallow the whole thing. It, <laughs> it takes time. <laughs> it, but it takes time and we have to, what we realize is by being able to say, well, you know, I do like being a show off is when we can say that and not feel like our stomach is flipping. Then what we've really done is we've been able to stand up against the guardians inside of us, which are really the numerous reinforcements from school and parents and church and every place else that have been internalized, the firing squad inside mm-hmm. of us that line up there. And we realize, oh my God, I can say I'm a show off and no one destroyed me or I didn't burst into flames or I wasn't struck dead. And that, you know, maybe I can behold this uh, of myself and maybe nothing horrible will happen. Now, this is all predicated upon the fact that you have enough ego strength And one of the precursors for shadow work and why shadow work is not done with children. (laughs) I mean, I know this seems... Do not try this at home. No, but you've got, you know, 11-year-old kids looking at, you know, TikTok wizards telling them how to find the darkest parts of themselves and, you know, fly that flag that we need a shadow, we have yes. to put some things away mm-hmm. that are too raw, too antisocial, too disapproved of, so that we, until we have an ego that's strong enough that you can sit across the table from the show off or the one who likes to hate or the violent one. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. can actually have an equal conversation with the violent one that lives in the deep forest inside of you. Because if you can't do that, if you're 10 and you're raised in a horribly violent home, and then you show up and you start being very violent with other 10-year-olds, the system is going to shut you down mm-hmm. and the system is going to regulate you because you were prematurely introduced to something that should be put in the shadow. Well, and when you're 10 and 11, the job is to build up an ego. Exactly. Yeah. And you have to kind of stay on the, the light side of things. Be well, a good boy, be a right. good girl, until you hit middle, midlife. And that's the other thing, is shadow work is work of midlife. Mm-hmm. It isn't the work of 17 years old. And we're talking about having a conversation with those parts of ourselves. Right. We're not talking about acting them out. 
being possessed by your shadow well, is dangerous. And, unless you unless you decide that you want to do a podcast. But, um, <laughs> well, but that's, that's a, some sort of. But kid. let's just yeah. say. Being a show off, dancing naked in front of your um, bedroom window when you're 30. I've right. asked waving you at not to talk. I've asked you not to talk about that. <laughs> I wasn't going to name you, Deb, but now you've outed yourself. Like that can that can cause a lot of problems, right? But the idea of I want to be seen, I want to sing and yes. dance, and I want to be free, right? In the right measure, in the right yes. place. Yes. And you can yes. fantasize your dancing naked in front of the window while you're on the podcast. Not that I'm doing that, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know there there are there are places right. there, where there our are shadow ways, can play. Right. There are ways. There are ways it can be integrated, but but it a uh, it's a um it's it's a it's a long term process of deep psychological work it isn't a superficial fix no it's the beginning of the individuation process mm -hmm. which happens really around 30 35 yeah so yep. mom dad protect your kids from their shadow from your shadow and their shadow by the way let them be bright and shiny let your teenagers stay on the mm -hmm. shiny side of the landscape there's mm -hmm. plenty of room to discover relative evil inside mm. of ourselves yeah. and not until you've got plenty of muscle. Yeah. Um, I want to say one more thing about projection is um, when we project something on someone, there is always a hook. So there there's, you, you can't, I, my, my thing about projecting the show off on someone, I couldn't, I couldn't project this on, um, you know, Diane, the mousy accountant in the office that that's mm -hmm. not where the projection landed. It landed on, on this this other young woman who who you know she did have a little bit of equality and other people would probably agree with me when I said oh she's such a show off other people said well yeah, yeah but it didn't bother other people the same way it bothered me so it was it was there objectively but my response to it was really disproportionate so I I want to move on to another way uh, to identify shadow. And that has to do with the things we are identified with. Uh, and, you know, so if there's a really passionate identification with, let's say, a political party, um, you know, a football team, um, you know, a value. I am a good person. <laughs> I yeah. am. I am a good person. <laughs> Okay, we'll just let that go by for the time being. <laughs> but but those things uh, we are strongly identified with, and you're right. I mean, it was really funny, but it's true. I people that say I'm good, I um, I would do anything for anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> See our episode about martyrs. <laughs> uh, so. so what are you identified with? Right. What's, what feels unassailable? Like you right. couldn't tolerate someone attacking you for that. When you're in the White Tower. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, one of the things that comes up for me about that, Deb, is um, I think probably the greatest literary example of shadow, and one that's very easy to uh, think about, is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert oh, Louis Stevenson. Right. Mm -hmm. So there is the cultured elegant Dr. Jekyll, who is revered by everyone in Victorian society in which he lives. And, and then he uh, creates this opportunity for this other side of himself, Mr. Hyde, who's violent and has low appetites and uh, w will, w will do anything, you know, kind of uh, ver very... Um, very Amoral. Amoral or immoral even to satisfy uh -huh. his, his uh, baser appetites. And, uh, you know, that's, that's an extreme example of what you're talking about, Joseph. But, you know, Dr. Jekyll's like, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a good person. But what's, what gets left out of that identification? What's the other side of that identification? You know, so if you say, well, I'm a vegan, what's the other side of that? Where is that in you? So uh, uh, a really um, more modern example is that movie Fight Club. 
Oh yeah, that's great. It's, right? So it's, the sky is a split personality, Jekyll Hyde, but what's on the other side is just fighting, like fist fighting. I mean, it becomes this apocalyptic thing at the end. But the shadow thing is that all these men are walking around in civil society, and they're a maitre d, and they're this, they're that, and then all of a sudden. You know, this sub-character, this uh, Mr. Hyde inside of this mild-mannered guy begins to set up these basement fight clubs where, where people are invited to just come and punch the crap out of each other. And then these, these tremendous scenes where, you know, he's walking through the city. You know, men have like, you know, stitches on their face or big bruises on their eyes. And they're all standing up in this very dignified way, and they're just kind of ever so slightly nodding at each other at this introduction to shadow uh, and just this primal war making, boxing, really, shadow, and the power of it. And by the way, how many men relate so dynamically to that movie? Yeah, yep, yeah. Having suppressed. That mm-hmm. kind of male boxing aggression, that that impulse to punch and fight, mm-hmm. that it hasn't just been um, sublimated, that it's been so repressed, so banished into the forest, and, and men have lined up in mass to keep that all so far away, that then, of course, it comes back to us in theater, which is very good because then we get to imagine yeah. our shadow. I'm so glad you brought that movie in. I, I ha- hadn't been thinking of it, but it's a great example of shadow dan- dynamics. And of course, I had to look it up, but the famous um, quote from it is, the first rule of Fight Club is, you do not talk about Fight Club. I broke so, the rule. I'm it, but, screwed. <laughs> but, it has to, but the point <laughs> is, it's brilliant because it's like, okay, this has to remain unconscious. So it has to remain a, a secret. secret. Yeah. Yeah. We can't know. We can't know that about ourselves. It's what it's what we can't allow ourselves to know. You know, I don't know. Um, you know how many of the listeners have seen this movie, but I remember when it came out, and I, I had no idea. A bunch of people said, "Let's go see this movie," and I said, "Okay." Uh, and I sat there in the theater, and, and I was like, "Oh, oh, no! I can't walk. I can't look at that." Yeah, and. And that was my call to attention of like, wow, this is so cringeworthy for me. And here it is, this movie in a theater filled with people. Everybody's watching it. And um, I and maybe some few other people were, uh, you, know, you know, closing our eyes and, and horrified by it. So it's like, huh. Ah. I wonder where that lives in Mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. Joseph, um, you're nodding in a particularly knowing way. (laughs) Uh, Because I have these experiences in theater and movies all the time. Like one of the things that I experience is vicarious performance shame. Oh, God. That if somebody is on stage and they're performing really badly, I experience so much shame inside of myself. And they could be just like singing and dancing and flubbing it all up, but it's it's like I am red and writhing it's in the audience. It's excruciating. It's excruciating. So that's, you know, the shadow of my incompetence <laughs> or like that kind of naive incompetence, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. is just so painful for me to sit with. Yeah. So again and again, we return to the theme of notice. Yeah. Notice when you have a strong reaction to something. Uh, just notice and then get curious about it. I'd also like to say that uh, shadow making um, can happen sometimes later in life. Mm-hmm. That things, things can disappear into the forest that used to be out front. So I will tell a story on myself. So I was raised in a very working class, New York home. Both of my parents were raised in abject poverty. 
and they kind of slowly made it into like the lower middle class very difficult for them and and uh, and so we did the best we could so one of my um my family's favorite things to do and i mean like every like the extended family is that when <laughs> you came home and bought something you had to take it out of the bag show everybody and particularly talk about what a bargain you got. So, you know, this, it, it, it normally it costs 70 bucks, but I got it. It's a steal. It was oh only $11 at the whatever store over there. And then this enormous kind of glow of approbation that the, oh, you really, you did it right. You did it right. And mom would do it. And grandma and gra my grandmother, who I love, Grandma Julia, <laughs> so she lived in Queens, and she was determined on on a very little salary to to shop for us as children. And she was uh, one of the telephone operators at the Roosevelt Hotel and back in the day, where you had like cords that you plugged in and out of holes, and you're you know pressing buttons around there. And so she would go to a department store in the area. She would find a couple of pieces of clothing. <laughs> That fit us, and then she would transport them to a different department and hang them up there. And then she would, <laughs> and then they would take like weeks to cycle back to where they were, and she would recognize them again because she would go every day after work. She would take them and and put them somewhere else, like you know, in the linen mm -hmm. department, and it would take weeks to walk themselves back. And so by the time she had cycled, she had lost the clothing and it had been found again. It had been marked down to almost nothing. <laughs> and so this enormous shrewdness. And then uh -huh. she'd bring home this, you know, clothing she wanted to give us. Now I was much older before I found out my grandmother's technique. Um, <laughs> but there was such um such pride yeah, yeah. in the uh -huh. shrewd deal. So fast forward, I'm <laughs> I'm in Washington, D.C., which is a highly conservative, highly, highly conservative city, and I'm getting my undergraduate degree, and I'm walking around, and the first conversation I would have with anybody, if they complimented something, was to tell them what a bargain it was. Oh, what a nice shirt. Oh, thanks a lot. I got it for 10 bucks <laughs> down at the so-and-so, but normally it's about 35 So, but And it came in red, but the red one was a little more expensive, so I'm wearing the blue one, which was only 3 bucks. How are you? <laughs> like that was my greeting card. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is like, why am I being <laughs> ghosted? Yeah, yeah. You know, oh. And so this is going on and on. And then finally, it's not so egregious. It's not like criminal behavior. Right. But I'm like this thing that's in the shadow because financial modesty right. is very powerful and, and more so the further south you get. And I live in the deep south now. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm, again, I'm in my late 20s, and no one has told me this before, mm -hmm. but I'm having someone who's much older than me over to the house, and, I'm, and I'm, they're saying, oh, your antiques are great, and then I'm launching into my story about how much I paid for all the antiques, and then she very so softly says to me, you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> she was like an analyst. That's great. That's great. That is it was great. like an entire piece of my childhood just tumbled through me. No one had ever said that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. again, harmless, but costly. Yeah. Yeah. So socially costly. Although, Joseph, I do have memories of you coming to Philly for the training weekends. And I'd be and like, the where, bargains are you, I where got are you staying? And you'd be like, oh my God, I got this great hotel room. A $500 room. I got it for 99 bucks on Expedia. I remember Deb looking at me and, and like, I think she's listening to me and she turns to Lisa or something. She's like, why does he always do this? It was so mystifying. I, was like, I can't stop. I can't stop talking about the bargain. But, but actually, it's a great example of uh, using and integrating shadow because 
I admired your ability to go online and check out Priceline and whatever other sources you had. And you've always been just great with your phone and you could just do this, do this, do this and kaboom, land on some great hotel room. I'm the deal. Uh, yes. And I, I couldn't do that. I just stayed at the same hotel over and over and over. <laughs> <laughs> the faithful hotelier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, I mean, we're we're having fun with this and 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 that's, you know, I I love that. I love laughing it up with you guys. But I I do I do want to kind of bring it in here as we're kind of getting ready to wrap up to 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 actually what it feels like to really recognize the shadow. Uh. Because um Again, I think, uh, you know, in some sources online, it's, it's made to be like almost like a cognitive process. Like you can just find it and, and then you can do away with it and then you're all good. But, but it actually, uh, I mean, Joseph, you used this word when we were prepping for the episode and it just is so perfect. It's really, it's really deflating yeah, to recognize a shadow. It is shaming and it is. Because it really lands. But, you know, and I want to say it is shaming, but I want to make a little bit of a distinction because um, I'm thinking of an experience I had some number of years ago where, where something landed really hard and I could see, I could really see my shadow and, and that my shadow had led me to do things that I wasn't proud of. And, you know, that's another, another thing to do when you're looking for shadow is look at your behavior. Where do you kind of act out and you look back and get like, what, what was I doing? So anyway, I had done something that I really shouldn't have done and it, it wasn't the right thing to do. And when I thought about why I got there, it was because of this shadow quality. And it, it really hit me like a ton of bricks. And I felt, um, I did feel ashamed, but not in that sort of shame spiral way where I knew that I'd sort of, it would all go back to normal in a day or two and I'd feel like myself. It was like, it was shame, but it was also something heavier and actually more substantial that I really got a glimpse of my own tail. And, uh, and I knew I had to just sit with it. And it was like, physically heavy and i remember i just had to go outside and take a long walk it's like oh shit you know that is so, me yeah yeah so it's um th this is hard work it's really hard work yeah uh i, I want to take us to a place i bet our a lot of listeners are waiting i bet they go there yeah to our dreams yep and um, Marie Louise von Franz has has this uh, great thing to say about that. She said, "We may resent it when one of our peers criticizes us, but what about when our own dreams reproach us?" Oops. Yep. Uh, and shadow is a key component of of our dreams. Shows up. All the time, uh, this is uh, you know this is just regular dream material. You can count on your dream maker lifting up some of your shadow, which in dreams is often identified as someone who is the same sex as the dreamer. So if if I have a dream about you know some other woman. Uh, who is, you know, some sort of decrepit, uh, unsavory, you know, whatever else kind of person, my first reaction would be like, oh my gosh, there was this weird uh, person in my dream. I, uh, I don't know what that was about. Well, that is part of me. And it might not be so big and ubiquitous, like it's a huge part of my personality, but it might be that that was uh, some part of me that showed up in an interaction 
a few days ago where where I felt like that or I I acted like like mm-hmm. like that. I I didn't have a feeling of uh basic um equanimity or equality and and, and I felt like that. Right. So if you have especially a same sex figure, but it's not always a same sex sex figure in the Sometimes dream. Sometimes it's a nope. monster. Mm-hmm. That's behaving in a way that you're like, oh, that was outrageous what that person in the dream did. It's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, that we're you know, mm-hmm. that's I need to look at what that what that part is and mm-hmm. what it might mean to me. And I also want to say, you know, we've we've just finished writing our book that's coming out in November. It's called Dreamwise, and there's a chapter in there on shadow. And one of the things that that we did that you know helped me get my hands around this concept even more. It's always helpful to write about things to learn about them. Is it's, <laughs> it you know a lot of times it's the same sex figure, but but sometimes our dreams show us acting in shadowy ways. So we have a dream where we're doing something really, really not okay. Yes. And, you know, it might be that the dream maker is saying, hey, you better take a look at this. Look, look, this is what it looks uh-huh. like. This is, you know, it's just like, like we were saying in the beginning, you, you ask for feedback from people. Well, your dream maker will give you feedback. <laughs> and, and I want to say that the feedback is not so that you can cage yourself up more fully. Right. Great, great point. Which is really important. and. And, you know, we can talk about, oh, here's here some feedback. And it, I mean, I, it's because nobody loves it. I mean, it's painful stuff. But Jung has this great quote, how can I be substantial if I do not cast a shadow? I must have a dark side also if I am to be whole. So one of the things that happens is that people who have enormous shadows often have very ephemeral qualities in their personality. I had a, a friend uh, that I um, passed away in Johnson City, Tennessee, and she and I had a long talk once, and she said um, she had been diagnosed with Parkinson. It was becoming very, very difficult for her. And she said um, in a deep southern accent, um, every morning when I woke up, my mother would tell me, be nice. Oh, God. Every time I went to bed, my mother said, remember, be nice. And here I am, 55. My life is looking very bad. And all I can think of is all the other things that I wish I had done that were not so nice. Oh, wow. Mm. It was, um, it was powerful. Yeah. I mean, I, I, felt it and she was very nice in all the socially appropriate yeah. ways that one mm-hmm. can be boxed in and then here when her life was becoming very limited and there were so many things she couldn't she could not do because of the limits of her body couldn't even imagine doing that she was mm. in she was in a state of appropriate grief around that mm-hmm. yeah. so Shadow helps us, and shadow often, if nothing else, adds an enormous authority to the ego. I really want people to sink into that. When you know something evil about yourself, Mm -hmm. you can stand before evil and not collapse. Yep. And I'm I'm wondering if it it's a good time to let remind listeners that we have another episode on how to work with shadow. Maybe we can link that in the sh- these show notes. Um, and then perhaps it's time to uh, switch to a dream. Sounds good. Today's dreamer is a 63-year-old woman who works in a small YMCA, and the dream is called The Black Light, The Vulture, and The Cat. (laughs) Uh, So here's the dream. I am at work. 
my mother and my brother's wife show up. My mother is upset and my sister-in-law is trying to soothe her. My mother tells me her cat is missing and there's a vulture in their yard. It seems she does not want to investigate, but she has brought me a black light and some rags and wants me to look at them with the black light for evidence of the cat and compare them to rags I have. I'm confused, but go along with it. I say it is day. The black light only works in darkness, but we'll try. I can't get the black light to work. My dad appears and says, you have to light it with a match. I try to do that and suddenly an orb appears. I ask if it's a Christmas ornament. I'm beginning to get exasperated and finally I say, do you want me to go and see what the vulture is eating? And my mother says, it's a brown vulture, not a black vulture. And I wake up. So her associations, uh, or excuse me, her contact, she says, both parents are dead. I'm about to enter couples counseling with my husband. Not that I necessarily feel it's related, but I am apprehensive. We have a solid marriage, but in some ways I feel alone and emotionally unfulfilled. I was very close to my mother. For the feelings in the dream, she says, I wanted to help my mother, but I didn't understand her reasoning why she wouldn't just face the difficulty and look for herself. But I was willing to look. And uh, for associations, she says, brown vultures are turkey vultures. I love birds. I know a lot about them. My husband especially enjoys watching vultures soaring above an outdoor restaurant we like to go to. I think vultures signify change. Maybe they are the cleanup crew of nature. My first just energy about this is um, out here in rural North Carolina, the vultures are unbelievably helpful. And, and it is remarkable how quickly they will clean up carrion. And, and it's so different. I mean, for instance, when I live in Virginia Beach, if some poor wild animal has been hit, it'll sit on the side of the road for weeks and weeks and weeks. If, if an animal dies at the side of the road in North Carolina, it is gone the next day. I mean, which is so remarkable that the cleansing effect of the turkey vultures and how effective they are at kind of policing uh, the world and facilitating this putrefaction. It's, it's remarkable, actually. Mm -hmm. And have you heard of a sky funeral? I have. No, what is it? Well, I, I, um, I'm not sure what sect it is, but there's a religious sect in India. And Joseph, do you know who it is that practices this? I know that it's in, it is in Tibet. Uh, it it's may in also Tibet. be in India, okay. but it is a common practice in Tibet. So where they, uh, the, you know, when you die, they take the body and I believe they pack it into pieces and they put it, you know, ceremonially on a mountaintop for the, the carrion mm. to come and, and feed on it. Actually, the family observes mm. um, that it is uh, part of that all things rise, all things sustain, and all things dissolve. Yeah. And seeing the rise and the dissolution of the body as part of the larger natural cycle. Mm -hmm. So there is something really archetypal here. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, um, it's not a, a dream that's immediately clear to me, but let's just look at it. My mother and my brother's wife show up. My mother is upset. My sister-in-law is trying to soothe her. So we have, this is really about the mother. Yeah, oh, but, hey, hey, but let's pause for a second, because I think it's important. I am at work. Yeah. And my mother and yeah. brother show up. So it could be relevant to, to wonder if this is in the work complex. Mm, mm -hmm. And yep. that all That's these cool. other really powerful complexes could be intruding on the work environment and the psyche wants perhaps that to be seen. 
So there's sort of an implication. The cat is missing and there's a vulture in the yard. And at the end, she says, do you want me to go and see what the vulture is eating? So somehow I think there's a, um, an implication that the cat has been eaten by a vulture. Never, we never come out and say that, but that seems to be the fear maybe that's, that's floating around through the dream. Is that the mother's except, cat? Except that would only happen if the cat was dead. Right. And in forensic crime scenes, you use the black light to find evidence of blood stains. Oh. Ah, I was wondering they, about the black they light. Fluoresce. Do they? Ah. They do. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, how do you know this, Joseph? <laughs> I, I think I've seen this in a bazillion movies. Oh, okay. <laughs> your past, your past life as a detective. Um, what, what I am going to is the very beginning. If I'm at work, there are three women. Uh, and then all this stuff about the black light, which I didn't know about. Dad appears. Uh, how do we get the black light to work? But you can't do it. It's a Christmas ornament. Uh, all this is sort of distractions. And then we get to, um, you should pardon the phrase, the meat of the matter. And she says, do you want me to go see what the vulture is eating? You know, and that there is the common sense. Uh, you know, forget about the rags and the black light and whether it's a Christmas ornament and all the rest of it. Um, nobody wants to go and look. And then the mother says it's a brown vulture, not a black vulture. Well, you know, it, it could be a purple vulture. But the point is, we haven't done the sensible, direct thing, which is to go and look, which makes me wonder about what is it, perhaps that is not being looked at in waking life where there are all these machinations about lights and orbs and what color vultures are and all the rest of it. And I wonder about what she says in her associations about uh, entering couples counseling. Um, right. So, I mean, it, it sounds like um, couples counseling is making her a little apprehensive because what will she find right. when she looks? And, and I, do, I do wonder a little bit um, sort of like why the mother is showing up, right? And, and so I would have a question for the streamer. What was your parents' marriage like? Yeah. What did you see there? And, and uh, you know, because it sounds like there's, it sounds like something about the mother complex doesn't want to know. Doesn't want, she doesn't want it investigated. She's upset that her cat is missing, but she doesn't want it investigated. So um, I th all of that, I want to parse it out because I think there's a lot of subtle hmm. material mm -hmm. yeah. moving through this. So the mother complex shows up and the sister-in-law is trying to soothe her. So you might imagine that the sister-in-law is, is more of a shadow figure. Mm-hmm. So what we have an out picturing is that there's an aspect of her own shadow that is still focused heavily on her deceased mother and is holding this concern that the mother is distressed and something is to be done. So what this makes me think is that one of the great difficulties when anyone who's close to us dies is that we have to live with the narrative that we have about our relationship to that person. And often as happens when we retrospect on the death of a parent, for instance, we can often be left with guilt and regrets, things that we wish we had said, things we wish we had done, things that we are bearing that in some way are unresolved. So the shadow is aware of the mother's suffering the ego is not comforting her. Mm -hmm. The shadow is comforting her. Now, how useful it might be for someone to discover that I am unconsciously hovering around the distress of the mother. Mm -hmm. Could that be relevant to the work environment? Mm -hmm. Very much so. 
it could very well be that there's someone in the work environment that she is unconsciously relating to like a mother. And is she being overly solicitous in some fashion? Overly soothing, overly caretaking? So just one question. But let's assume this has to do with her own unresolved material with her own mother. The mother then seems to be giving the problem, the thing she is um, being soothed around, which is that her cat is missing Mm -hmm. and the black light shows up as possibly a forensic thing. And by asking her to look at her own rags and see if there is blood on them, potentially, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or her rags, the issue is that the archetypal feminine on some level is missing. What does it mean to have a mother whose instinctive feminine is missing? And what might the impact be relative to her marriage, if she associates Mm -hmm. it there, or relative to how she deports herself in the work environment? Mm -hmm. If the mother had no access to her cat energy, which is an enormously important dynamic in the feminine, is it possible that the dreamer also doesn't know how to recognize her cat energy? Mm. It doesn't mean that her cat is dead, but mm-hmm. it may mean she doesn't know what that looks like, as often is true. If the parents can't put words or really are not conscious of something, often it then is the work of the child, or now the adult, to figure out what that might mean. Rags are often used to clean things up, right? We have a rag pile. Mm-hmm. We use it to scrub, to dust, to this, to that. You have rags in a garage to wipe up the grease. So rags are evidence of the things that have been cleaned up. So she feels confused, understandably. And then the thing that would reveal the hidden information, which is the black light, mm-hmm. doesn't work. Suddenly the father appears. This is the first masculine image. And the father, often associated with logos and ego consciousness, light offers a a match. And then suddenly there's a glowing orb that doesn't seem to be revealing anything about the black light, but is associated with Christmas around the winter solstice, which is associated with the birth of light. So we have this abandonment of looking into the darkness for the answer. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to look into the light or something. The orb is also a symbol of the self. So it may also be that she she has been looking into the unconscious. And perhaps there is something... There's a question as to whether or not she really can discover what she is looking for in the retrospective position, looking back to the dead mother, looking back to the childhood, perhaps. The light and the orb may offer a prospective position, which is maybe it's time to look forward Mm -hmm. to, to the birth of new light, Christmas to the birth of the new child inside of you, the divine child. She can't make sense of any of it, and she's exasperated. I don't know what's going on with my mother. I don't know what's going on with my father. Will anybody tell me what they want from me? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Pause. That's the problem. Because it's at that moment we see that the dreamer is caught in the puella. Will some parental figure, make sense of what's happening here, tell me who to be and what to do, and that brings us full circle to the work situation, which is, if you're projecting mom or dad or any number of things onto um, the work authority figures, and you're sitting there saying, will someone just tell me what to do? She has no initiative. And the sad thing is, if you had an inner cat, you'd have initiative. Because cats are (laughs) remarkably self-determining creatures, and they will will maraud through your house and do whatever the hell they want to do. 
So I think the, the moral of the story for me is go find a cat inside of yourself. <laughs> and you might not need to ask the parental figures inside of you and outside of you what you're supposed to do mm-hmm. or how you're supposed to understand what's going on around you. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have that, that sort of pinged a few things for me. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to land this totally Joseph, but, but, um, this idea that, that you, that you had about, um, uh, you know, uh, the kind of the Puella, I mean, here's, I'm not sure I would totally go with Puella, but here's, here's what it broke loose for me, which I think is related is, um, I'm I'm thinking again about the marriage. You know, if you're like, well, I have a solid marriage, but I feel kind of lonely in it. There's a way that you haven't entirely owned your responsibility in the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I and I say that with all compassion because I think this happens to lots of us mm-hmm. where we we just we want to be generous. We we want to be um a good companion. We want to be a good partner. We are maybe a little conflict avoidant. And, and so we don't let ourselves know that we're, that we feel like we're not getting enough. And, and so over time that can really kind of calcify things and create a big chasm, create a lot of distance, but it, it does kind of come from almost wanting to be agreeable of kind of wanting to be um, told what to do instead of kind of standing up being like, no, I'm going to go find out what's wrong. You know, it, it is to, I think that, I think the, the kind of headline for the dream maybe is there's a problem and there's ambivalence about finding out what the yeah. nature of the problem is. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And I do wonder, I mean, I know it says we're at work and we always say, you know, if it's said at work, it might be about career. But I also wonder about the word work because it could be that the marriage needs work. And we do refer to the work in therapy. So sure. I, I, I'm, I, I have a kind of question about that. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, it's so interesting, the idea of black light, mm-hmm. which, uh, you know, reminds me of the alchemical black sun. Mm-hmm. Um, that there's something really dark, but there's also light in it, mm-hmm. which might perhaps prefigure what it's like to come to terms with what's really disappointing in the marriage. Mm-hmm. But what are the possibilities around that as well? Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, uh, I think you guys have done uh, <laughs> really an amazing job. And, you know, the only thing I can add is I'm at work, but what's the work? Right. Is it inner work? Is it marital work? Is it career work? What, where's the, what work are we talking about here? And uh, then, as I uh, did before, I go skip to the end. Mm-hmm. And finally, I say, do you want me to go see what the vulture is eating? And my mother says, it's a brown vulture, not a black vulture. So... That is not an answer to the question. No, it's not an answer to the question. And also our dream ego, as uh, you guys, especially you, Joseph, have parsed out, is um, she's asking, do you want me to go see? And um, I would love to change that statement to enough already. I'm going to go and look. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's interesting, Joseph. You you did that great thing with the rags that they're evidence of what has been cleaned up, and then the dreamer, of course, associated vultures with being a clean up crew. Mm-hmm. So something's been cleaned up, but it's hidden. You know, it's 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 not clear what's been swept under the carpet, maybe mm-hmm. emotionally. The other thing I want to um, point out because I really do think this has something to do with separating from the parental imagos on another layer, is that even in the significant context of the dream, he says, we have a solid marriage, but in some ways I feel alone and emotionally unfulfilled. I was very close to my mother. And and that those things flow in sequence. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Our writing is so w- wonderful <laughs> manifestations of psyche. Yeah. The words we choose, yeah. how we sequence them. So for her to um, just, if we just change the punctuation, I feel alone and emotionally unfulfilled. I was very close to my mother. So again, there's a way in which the mother and the father, for that matter, the parental imagos, can interfere with our access to animus in a woman's psyche and our access to bonding to the, to the adult partner. It doesn't mean that we're behaving in childish ways or that we don't have wildly successful lives. These are very subtle, subtle, subtle dynamics. So, feeling alone and emotionally unfulfilled, I was close to my mother. So, to take that phrase, I wonder how intimate and emotionally fulfilling the relationship to the mother really was. Because in the dream, mother is very indirect. It's very (laughs) difficult to understand what she wants from her. It's very difficult to understand Mm -hmm. what's happening. And the daughter is soothing the mother. The mother is not soothing the daughter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can make all kinds of stories about this, but the image in the dream is that the mother's needs and distress are the dominant thing rather than yeah, the child's. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's, now, a, that's a great point. Yeah. So again, I, we don't know her mother, but it mm-hmm. is possible if this is an outpicturing that um, there's, there's a real wound there about who takes care of you and, and the per- parentification mm-hmm. of children and and is that part of the feeling of being alone and unfulfilled? Does it really have anything to do with the spouse, whereas in fact is a much deeper relational wound that might be much more successfully dealt with through a retrospective analysis? And if that were healed, she might find that many relationships are more fulfilling, including the marital and that she might feel connected to life and to many people, including the spouse, if she can move outside of the mother's narcissistic complex. Hmm. That's great. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.